are scientists actually doing when they conduct an experiment or scientific study? If you're tempted to say collecting data, you're not wrong, but you're missing some important context. It's true that scientific experiments and studies are designed to collect data, but they're designed to collect data for a reason. Scientists use data that comes from their experiments and studies as part of a pattern of reasoning or argumentation. Often, scientists design experiments and studies as a way of testing an hypothesis. The data they collect, after it's appropriately interpreted, helps to confirm or disconfirm the hypothesis. In other words, the data fits into a pattern of reasoning that is essential to the way science works. Scientists decide what to test in their experiments and studies based on the expectations they generate from their hypotheses. In general, that relationship can be represented as a conditional, if-then statement. If the hypothesis is true, then the experiment should have this outcome. We'll write that as if H, then E. E is for evidence. And we'll use the arrow to represent the logical if-then relationship. If the scientist reasons correctly about the expectations that follow from the hypothesis, and if the experiment or study is set up correctly, then the data that the scientist collects from that experiment or study can tell them a lot about the truth of their hypothesis. This is especially true when the scientist does not observe what they expected. In that case, the scientist can conclude that the hypothesis must not be true. This is just a feature of the logic of how certain statements work together. The logical form, if H, then E, not E, therefore not H, is valid, which means that so long as the two premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. Here's a simple example. Imagine you're a school-age kid and you wake up one morning and you're not sure what day it is. Your hypothesis is that it's Tuesday. And you know the following statement is true. If it's Tuesday, then I have to go to school. If T, then S. Your mom or dad comes into the room and you ask if today is a school day. When they say no, you now have the evidence you need to conclude that it's not Tuesday. This is a valid conclusion. If T, then S is true. Not S is also true. And those two things together make it so that you can conclude with certainty that not T is true, that it isn't Tuesday. What about the case where they tell you that you do need to go to school today? What can you conclude from that evidence? In that case, if T then S is true, and we learn that S is true, does that tell us that today is Tuesday? No, it doesn't. Simply knowing that we need to go to school is compatible with other hypotheses as well. It could be Wednesday, for example. This argument if T, then S, S, therefore T, is not valid. Let's go back to how scientists reason. If their hypothesis entails certain expectations, and those expectations are not met, then they can conclude that the hypothesis is not true. If H, then E, not E, therefore not H, is valid. However, if those expectations are met, they can't conclude that their hypothesis is true. If H, then E, E, therefore H, is not valid. The type of arguments we've been talking about so far are called deductive arguments. Deductive arguments are the kind of logical argument where the truth of the premise statements guarantees the truth of the conclusion statement. Like we saw, a good deductive argument is one that is valid. If an argument is invalid, it fails to be a good deductive argument. There's a lot more forms of deductive arguments than the simple ones we've been thinking about here. Studying these is the kind of thing you would be doing in a logic class. But other kinds of arguments are also relevant for science. Think of the case where expectations are met by the experiment. If H, then E. E, therefore H. We said that this isn't a valid deductive argument. But there's still something right about it. The school-aged kid we were imagining may not know for sure that it's Tuesday once their parent tells them that they have to go to school, but this is additional evidence in favor of their hypothesis that it's Tuesday. One of the puzzles in the philosophy of science 
is how to describe the relationship between evidence that meets your expectations and the hypothesis that generated those expectations in the first place. It seems clear that evidence in line with your expectations should strengthen your confidence in the truth of the hypothesis, even if it isn't deductively guaranteed. One way to think about the kind of argument that scientists make in this case is as an inductive argument. Induction is another kind of logical form, distinct from deduction. In an inductive argument, you use your past experiences to make a prediction about the future. And when your prediction is right, that allows you to continue to have confidence in your hypothesis. For example, imagine if every time you walk through a particular path in the woods, you always saw a woodpecker. It would be a reasonable prediction that the next time you walk that path, you would also see the woodpecker, but it's not guaranteed. The fact that you had seen it before doesn't make the prediction true. Here's what the logical form of this inference looks like. You saw the woodpecker the first time, the second time, the third time, etc. So you conclude that you will see it the next time. This is called an inductive inference. Notice that all it really allows you to conclude is that it's very likely that you'll see the woodpecker, not that it's guaranteed. It's possible that you won't see the woodpecker the next time you walk that path. Inductive inferences like this are one way that philosophers have attempted to model the relationship between expectations and evidence. Here, we would say that if H, then E is true. We have seen E many times. Therefore, we can be reasonably sure that H is very likely to be true. This simple inductive model of scientific reasoning has shortcomings, though. For example, it doesn't allow you to quantify how confident you should be in the hypothesis based on the evidence you have. There is one more argument form that is especially relevant for science. This one is called abduction, or inference to the best explanation. In this way of reasoning, a scientist makes an inference to what the most likely hypothesis is based on the evidence they already have. Instead of starting with a hypothesis, generating expectations, and testing those expectations through an experiment or a study, in abductive reasoning, the evidence that you have guides your thinking about what the most plausible hypothesis is. This is often used in cases where you can unify the explanation for several different things by adopting one theory. In the famous example of Isaac Newton and the law of gravity, Newton was able to explain everyday evidence like apples falling towards the surface of the earth and the orbit of the moon by a single hypothesis. Everything gravitationally attracts everything else. This is called universal gravitation. The moon falls towards the surface of the earth in the same way that an apple falls towards the earth, under the influence of the same force the moon stays in orbit rather than crashing into the earth because it has just the right velocity in the perpendicular direction that it constantly misses. These three patterns of reasoning are at the heart of what scientists do. Evidence from experiments and studies is used in one or more of these reasoning patterns to draw inferences about hypotheses. This is how science can take us beyond what we immediately see to deeper knowledge of how the world works.